Was I ever that young to come back now like rain? Even when the mango birds and children vanish, the poet tells us of the common and good in our bones. Was I ever that young to come back now like rain? I remember always loving to sit cross-legged on the counter in the kitchen with my mom and you would give me this little mason jar of fresh cream and you would just say, shake this, shake this till it's butter. And you would turn your back and keep doing your work and I would, and I would just, just do it because I knew that there was some kind of magic, you know, the magic of, of being in the kitchen with your mother. Was I ever that young to come back now like rain? There is no ultimate truth, right? But it is my truth from my memories and impressions. You know, the latest science on memory is that every time we access a memory, we're actually slightly rewriting the files. You know, we're, we're storing the latest version rather than looking at the original. Nebraska, yeah, Nebraska, some kind of flat highway and just hours and hours of straight flat fields and this cop, he pulls us over and we just laugh our faces off after because we were just <laughs> kids, remember? Just trying to get out, just go. Go west, go anywhere. So memory is generally individual memory, but I'm interested in the connections we can make between our individual stories and the broader cultural story of our time and place, and then the, the great story of the planet, the deep time. Where storm clouds complain, but bring no comfort. Was I ever that young to come back now like rain. You're listening to Hyacinth Podcast, where we ponder beauty, anger, love, loss, fear, glory, and the unbreakable heart of human living. I'm Carmel Michael. I'm a writer and musician, and I study literature. This episode is about memory work, the stuff we make out of our memories and what they make out of us. I'll discuss personal and public memory and how both affect the way we move through the world. We'll hear from writer, critic, poet, Kenise Lubrin, historical fiction writer, Emma Donahue, who you might know from the Oscar nominated film adaptation of her novel, Room, and two memoirists, Jennifer Brody, a writer and professor at Bard College in Massachusetts, and Pauline Dakin, a well-known Canadian journalist a fellow of the MIT Night Science Journalism Program, and a memoirist, whose book was a bestseller last year. So, memory. What is it, anyway? I don't mean in the biomedical or neurological sense. I mean, what does it do for us? Old philosopher guys from Plato to Freud saw memory as central to being human, to the way we construct ourselves, the self. But Toni Morrison describes memory like a river. She talks about how the Mississippi River was diverted, straightened out in places, but that it always floods there because, quote, all water has a perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was. Then she says, writers are like that. Remembering where we were, what valley we ran through, what the banks were like, the light that was there, and the route back to our original place. Don't you love that? But we barely have to remember anything these days. I don't need to remember my own phone number, or my best friends, I don't need to know how to get anywhere or memorize facts, dates, times. We have phones for that. It's true, we've kind of downloaded our memories into, you know, photographs on Instagram and that kind of thing too. Yeah, I think parts of our brain are atrophying now. We just don't spend very much time daydreaming. And daydreaming is, is, is when a lot of memories will surface. Very few younger people 
do that anymore. Of course, the importance of memory to our cognitive, physiological, and psychological function cannot be overstated. When I was a kid, I watched a family friend go through Alzheimer's. It was strangely sweet sometimes, like when he asked his wife of 50 years what her name was and if she'd like to go to dinner with him, as if love had a memory of its own, but the rest of the time it was so, so cruel. I fear losing my memory, of course, but I also sometimes fear my memories. Secretly, I wish they were a little more quiet and polite. Do you put memories away in boxes under beds at the top corners of closets, or do you keep them all around you, cluttered up on your mantle and stuck to the front of your fridge? There are really never enough magnets, are there? There's no right way to remember. But how about this? What if your job was to find and report on facts? And what if you were really good at it, like national CBC reporter Good? And what if you found out one day that all your childhood memories were part of one big bizarre lie? This is where we start, with Pauline Dakin's award-winning memoir, Run, Hide, Repeat. Well, Run, Hide, Repeat is my family's story, essentially. It's about uh, my brother and I growing up knowing that there was something very strange about our family. Included in that were were that twice we just disappeared from our lives. And when we were in our early 20s, we were told that we were on the run from the mafia. And we were told that our dad was involved in organized crime. There were, you know, circumstances in our lives that made that seem, I wouldn't say plausible, but possible. And then it was some years after that, I learned something that was even more shocking to me about all of that. I guess you would call that the second plot twist. (laughs) I I initially didn't think I would publish it, but then uh, there was a fairly major discovery as I was writing that made me realize there was value in telling people about this, that that there were messages that I wanted to share. I mean, the difficulty of writing memoir is knowing that memory can be very unreliable, especially childhood memories, which are often more impressions than real memories. And so, you know, then you're going around to people trying to get affirmation. Does this ring true? Do you remember that? And so on. But I find the topic of memory fascinating. And and if you look at some of the brain science around this, which I have, when there's a lot of emotion linked to a memory, it tends to be more forcefully taken in by the brain. So uh, somehow memories get laid down in a way that stick. And so I thought, okay, maybe these are some of them quite reliable memories because of that. Um, There is no ultimate truth, right? Everybody who was connected with my story in any way would have different ideas or memories about it. But it is my truth from my memories and impressions which I worked really hard to confirm. You know, I interviewed anybody I could think of who might uh, be able to help me with that. But in the end, for me, it is about imposing narrative on what has happened in my life in a way that helps me get past it. So figuring out what happened and then deciding how to feel about it is part of it. Pauline writes that she went back and forth between wanting to forget about the fear she had lived with, which had very real consequences to her health and state of mind, and what she calls a compulsion to understand. In writing her memoir, she had to juggle her roles as journalist, whose job it is to seek facts, writer who's supposed to tell a good story, and the person whose true story it is. So yes, as somebody who had this sort of life experience, it is about being true to the feeling of what happened to me and my brother. As the journalist, it's really wanting to dive deeply into what were the facts and what can I confirm and how how can I confirm it? And, you know, can I go back into historical records and find out that, yes, it was raining on that day <laughs> and that I'm remembering something and that would confirm that that was true, that kind of thing. And then, you know, as a parent, it's a whole other thing. It's deciding which of these things will be most meaningful to my kids as I try to tell them what happened and the impact that that has had on all of us. So yeah, there's a a real complex dance in all of that. And then as the writer, it is deciding, you know, not everything that happened is in my book, but I had to decide, yeah, my, it's an extreme crazy story, 
but what are some of the universal things that will be meaningful to people? The universal. That sounds big. But Jennifer Brody says this is a thing. It's called a purposeful memoir. A purposeful memoir is a memoir shared because you think that your story might be a benefit to others. It starts with the personal and then ripples out into the political, planetary, so social and and global. It seems maybe uh, counterintuitive, but I really do think that this process of purposeful memoir is a, a good starting point to figure out, well, what is important to me? And um, how, how am I living that in my personal life? And how can, I, how can the way I'm living ripple out and make a difference more broadly? I love this idea of a purposeful memoir, because what is the value of sharing the story? If it's just for me, well, there's no value in it. Although there's value for me, but if there is something that I have learned along the way that can, that I can share, if there's some insight that somebody else brings to it, you know, then I think it, there's a purpose to it being out in the world. Now, on a personal level, yeah, I feel a remarkable sense of freedom from this because what happened was always a terrible weight and the dysfunction that it caused in my family, for me and my brother in particular, but for other people, you know, my dad, we disappeared on my dad and, you know, for years he really, you know, he didn't see us. He didn't know if we were okay. He, you know, and we, as a result, really didn't have much of a relationship with him. And then to make this discovery uh, that I've kind of alluded to that ch- completely changed my thinking about everything. Um, it was like being able to just put it down and stop dragging it around behind me my whole life. And as a result, people who I've known for years would say to me, you know, you're quite reserved. I feel as though I can come this close and no closer. And I remember thinking, yeah, well, you know, I have this big secret. And Once I had told my secret, especially in such a public way, it was like I tore down a wall between myself and everybody else in the world, that I I didn't have a secret that was isolating me anymore, and my relationships became much richer because of it. To tear down walls, to connect memory work does this. My name is Jennifer Brody and I am a professor of literature and communications at Bard College at Simons Rock in Great Barrington, Massachusetts and Nova Scotia is where I've done my best writing. Mm. I'm also uh, a memoirist and author. I met Jennifer when I took one of her workshops last summer in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Under Jennifer's direction, a group of us learned techniques for memoir writing crafting our memories into prose or poetry and then bravely sharing bits of it with one another. Afterwards, Jennifer and I walked down to the nearby banks of the Bay of Fundy. The tide was out. This region of Nova Scotia hosts some of the highest tides in the world. I'm talking like 20 to 50 feet. So the the tide was out and there was just this beautiful clay, mud, revealed shimmering in the afternoon light with a steady wind reminding us that the tide would be on its way back soon. Thinking of this now, it reminds me of Toni Morrison's Mississippi River with its perfect memory, and it seems right that we found our way there to talk about how our memory connects us to each other and to the earth. I have worked with a lot of women in particular who are telling stories that are, you know, deeply held trauma. Um, and it's not comfortable at all for them to go back there. And yet they're compelled to go back there. There's this tension. I often say to people, um, if you remember it, it must be for a reason. Because there's so much of life that we forget, right? Lots and lots and lots of moments of our days that we forget, but there are these things that we remember. And if we remember them, there's a reason. And there's something that's that needs to be told, but we need to understand from that moment. And it can be really helpful to write it down. I learned something really interesting from your workshop today because your workshop um, forced us, asked us, <laughs> asked us invited to, you. Invited. <laughs> your workshop invited us to think about memoir as being filtered through seeking joy, or seeking moments of joy in our life. I think a lot of us spend time on remembering or focusing on our suffering, our pain. But what is it that we can be doing 
in our life, like at this moment, that helps us make happy memories as opposed to only remembering the more painful things? Well, being aware, being aware of um, holding on to joyful moments. I think as adults, we just kind of rush pell-mell through our lives and get things done. And I think we have to be more aware of, um, you know, picking up our heads and savoring the beauty mm. in, in, in when, when it happens. And um, writing about it is one way to do that. I was saying that um, I'm interested in aligning the personal, political, and planetary, right? So memory is generally individual memory, but I'm interested in the connections we can make between our individual stories and the broader cultural story of our time and place. And then the, the great story of the planet, the deep time that we're part of, which is so visible here on the Bay of Fundy. Do you see things, the earth as holding something? In other words, preserving something even when we lose it as people. Is that something that you've thought about? Are you asking whether the earth has consciousness? I think so. <laughs> does the earth have a memory? <laughs> yes, the earth does have a memory. That's clear. So, you know, the fossil record. And, um, but after, you know, most of my career, much more Freud-oriented, I've suddenly become interested in Jung and the collective unconscious and, you know, the great reservoir of stories that are held in the archetypes. Um, so that is the kind of thing that um, we can reach through our individual memories and out into a much broader pool of stories. And I think it enriches our individual personal lives to know how we connect to the broader culture. There are things that it's imperative the broader culture remembers, must never forget. But Sometimes we, as individuals, want to erase those very same things. This tension is what Emma Donahue explores in her latest novel, Akin. It's the story of an elderly man named Noah, who tries to unearth the untold story of his mother's past in Nazi-occupied France during World War II. His mother had never spoken of her time there, and he only learns of it when he finds some old photographs. Noah searches for his mother's story in the museums, the archives, and in the streets of Nice. Emma Donahue was born in Ireland but lives in Canada. Her books have sold millions, and the film she scripted from her book, Room, was nominated for four Academy Awards. I was lucky to catch up with her at the Kingston Writers' Festival this past fall. You know, there are parts of our past that we'd like to put aside, and Women in particular who were politically involved in the war, a lot of them just put that away at the end. It's as if they found they could not reconcile that with their kind of 1950s feminine persona. Um, so I found the idea of a, of a past that you set aside or tuck away very interesting. What is it that compels us to know the stories of our parents, do you think? Well, often when we're young, we just don't take much interest. We never think to suddenly say one day, what did you do before I was born? Or even to ask our parents what they were doing all the times they weren't with us. We're, we're very oblivious to all that. So I found it a very poignant idea that only towards the end of his life does Noah start asking himself questions about his mother that, of course, he could have asked her all the time she was alive. And so many of our parents, you know, we lose to either death or dementia. My mum died of dementia recently. So that made me think an awful lot about memory and to watch it slipping away and to ask yourself, what is left you know if if consciousness goes if memory goes what is still there so probably my mother's dementia was a huge influence on making me brood a lot over questions of memory I, I heard somewhere in an interview you did that um, your mother kept very sort of practical daily diaries and that you now have them. They're, they're, they're wonderfully evocative because they're so telegraphic. You know, they're not full sentences. They're lots of little phrases. And she lists all the films she went to and what she thought of them and the tiny things about the day. And sometimes you don't know whether what you're reading is at the level of weather or emotion. Like it might say, terrible day. And then I gradually realized, oh, she meant it was raining, you know. <laughs> so I'm so glad I have these. I've been working through them really slowly year by year, and I, I get to feel so close to her. And the her that she was before the dementia, you know, it's like I'm, I'm getting back her mind. Do you feel that your writing is a sort of act of resistance against loss? Is that how you think about the function of why you're a writer? Yeah, yeah. Writing is a bulwark against loss, definitely. And writing about things that are precious to me, I suppose, like I don't get to live in Nice anymore, but by writing a book about it, I, I got to make the experience last longer than it had. 
you know, it's funny. I've I've always pointedly avoided writing about writers. I don't like when fiction is just kind of, you know, the author's lifestyle thinly disguised. So I usually try and go out of my way to avoid it. But akin, because Noah is trying to find out what his mother did in the war, I realized about halfway through he's effectively having to do what, what historical fiction writers do in that he is amassing all the evidence and then having to just speculate wildly and kind of daydream and, and test his hypotheses and his his narratives against what he knows of his mother just always looking for sort of the feel of her does it ring true um so yeah i realized this book of all my books is probably the most meta in that it comments a lot on sort of how we form stories about the past yeah and you also in a way not only had to be a writer for this story but you also had to create an almost an archive for him to work off of. Yeah, because I have spent such a lot of time in those archives. And I'm, I'm so aware of the limits of archives too, like knowledge being hidden in archives. For instance, Anne Lister, a hu hugely known figure nowadays because of the, the recent series Gentleman Jack, but I've been a big Anne Lister fan for about 25 years. And I remember um, in, a, in a library in England finding an account of her groundbreaking early 19th century diaries, um, which are basically full of lesbian sex. She was seducing pretty much every woman in Yorkshire, but I found her listed as the diaries containing an account of the Yorkshire woolen trade. And I remember thinking, this is actually worse than not including her at all. This is a lie. This is a cover-up of what this archive really is. I, I wanted to ask you about public spaces in this book. There's a lot of them. And I think Maybe we talk about Google first. I think of it as sort of a public space of memory. Do you think of it that way? Well, it's it's funny. When the internet came along, I remember thinking, oh, great, this is all about, you know, modernity and we can, you know, send letters to each other really fast and so on. But soon I realized that it's actually like this kind of amazing Victorian antiquarian attic. You know, people share their little bits of history. They put old things online. So often I'm using some modern device like a searchable database, but the actual content on there is, say, 19th century local newspapers. So, so it's amazing how much history there is on the Internet. And, of course, you know, the Internet's kind of slapdash attribution, the way quotes will get ascribed to Gandhi or whatever, that happens a lot in history too and genealogy. So, you know, they're very messy sources, but they're, they're hugely rich as well. So yeah, it, it's funny how much of my time I spend on the internet effectively looking up the past. I use it as a kind of a very unpredictable time machine. And your book deals with um, a very specifically traumatic and difficult time in history, obviously, um, Nazi era. Well, when you're a niece, you know, it, it's, it's so sunny and friendly and touristy and international but then it feels like you are tapped on the shoulder by world war ii all the time and the french they do an amazing line in kind of very powerfully written etched in stone plaques about world war ii and they'll often have this amazing sort of direct address to you you know in quite formal french they will be like passerby stop look somebody was hanged on this spot so they really grab you by the throat but of course they're not putting up plaques to say Lots of people did nothing here and just waited for the war to be over. Or, you know, they don't put up a little plaque that says somebody went and ratted out her neighbors to the, to the police here. So they only memorialize the kind of official, very noble version of French history, which is we all bravely joined the resistance. And that's just not true. So, yeah, there's a huge gap between those, um, you know, the, the, the public memory and then the kind of facts of what really happened. The memorial is really attempting to do something that I am not sure it can do. My name is Kinesia Lubrin, and I am a poet, writer, critic, teacher. The memorial, depending on its context, I think could produce some severe and unintended malfunctions. The narratives that stick, uh, they contain a lot of capacity for a kind of flattened interaction with those things where we come to see the subjects of the, of the, the memorializing as merely victims of a terrible crime or, you know, the broader complexities of their humanity somehow slips from the work of, of memorializing. And I think poetry has a particular capacity to escape a lot of those pitfalls because it's not really working with tactile materials, you know, like concrete or iron or brass. Poetry gives us language, and language is a mutable material. 
it, I think it opens up the opportunity for a more complex engagement with the memorial and with the archive where what we have is further possibility. Kinesia Lubrin grew up in St. Lucia. She now lives in Ontario, teaches at Humber College, and is the current writer in residence at Queen's University, which is where I met her. Her poetry contends with the large histories and violent pasts, the history of slavery, how it informs her own writing, and the contemporary Black experience, and how poetry writes against what she calls the deliberate amnesias of our world. Memory work for me is care work. It is a way to attend to the long durée of a certain history, uh, the one that is mine, the one that is connected to the transatlantic slave trade and how I am, like many who descend from slaves, I'm cut off from a huge part of my pre-colonial history. And so a lot of what I hold is memory. And I think for me it's really, really important as Christina Sharp puts it in In the Wake, uh, to attend to the past because I'm writing into a peopled place. And I have a certain responsibility, a certain ethical responsibility to engaging with memory, not just as a category of knowledge, but as a way to be in the world. And so because so much is unknown to me, I think it's useful to think about the poem as homing toward, uh, and I know that sounds really very weird and sci- you know, sci-fi-y and new agey, but there's a certain homewardness that I think I hope into the poem, that the poem will find its, its ideal reader, whoever needs to read it for whatever reason they need to read it. And I suppose that's kind of my faith in language. It's my faith in poetry. Um, and so who needs to read a poem? You know, that's a great question. Uh, and I think the answer is everybody, because of poetry's capacity to honor our complexities and to put us back in ourselves when we are alive in a world that conditions us to be sources of extraction all the time. Everything is always being extracted from everyone. We go to school to learn how to be best extracted from. We go (laughs) to church to learn how to be best extracted from. Everywhere, we're always told that we are to be sourced, right? And to somehow exist in this really morbid idea of service. And then poetry is that reminder that actually, you know, we're a lot more complex than that. Our needs as a human involve the many ways in which we can exist beyond the functional and that it's okay for us to loiter in our being. It's okay for us to disagree and i think our current hyper polarized moment is an iteration of our incapacity to hold complexity in a world that we understand as as illusory as forming deliberate amnesias for us right so to exist in that in that hyperspace i like to call it the the poetic hyperspace is to also attend to the the associated things that, that lets us sit in our complexities in the world. And so I think poetry's power is in its capacity for associative thinking. We're not relying on the typical syntactic linearity of prose, which says one thing comes before the next thing comes before the next thing. Poetry says, leave all the doors open. Um, and so those materials of history, of family, of lore, of literature, those create a kind of constellation of things that allow me a certain freedom that I don't need to engage with on the level of, say, historiography or um, anthropology or some other kind of formulaic way of assessing the value of things. Uh, And for me, that liberation that memory offers me lets me move across geographies It lets me move through time. Memory is the river of our lives, flowing between family stories and larger geographies and histories. It's so important that we ask critical questions 
of the public memories constructed around us. Who built this place? Why is that statue or that monument there? Who is curating this archive? But personal memories and the prose or poetry that keeps them alive is the language of connection and belonging. Our, our storytelling, you know, say within family, gives us a sense of who we are, who we belong to, what we value. And if you don't have that, I think you can feel a little at sea. And so when I told my story, a lot of people said to me, well, how come you're so normal? And I, I make no claims to normalcy, but, but the truth is both my brother and I have good lives. We're okay. Even in the middle of all the chaos of our lives, we were so well loved. And even though it was our mom who was kind of at the root of a lot of that chaos, she is somebody who just instinctively knew how to care about people. And she was a very sensitive person. And, um, you know, so she gave us that strong sense of belonging, that strong sense of being cared for. And in some research I've done since, I realized that that is one of the key things to building resilience. Resilience being not necessarily something you're born with. I think the, the research is emerging to suggest that resilience is something that we can build in any part of our lives. But really key is that one caring person in your life who has your back, who will give you the ability to bounce back to be okay. And, and that was something I really wanted to share. I remember the first thing you threw, the first thing that broke, and, and I cleaned it up. I'm, of course, I, I would never forget that. The thing that I try and remember is that I loved you. I loved you despite everything. I just try and, I try and remember that. This has been Hyacinth Podcast, Memory Work. Thank you to my generous guests, Pauline Dakin, Jennifer Brody, Emma Donahue, and Kinesia Lubrin. Jennifer teaches workshops around the world, so you can pick up her guide to writing purposeful memoir and take a workshop somewhere. Find a link to her website at hyacinthpodcast.com, along with links to all the other books we discussed. Pauline's memoir, Run, Hide, Repeat, Emma's new novel, Akin, and Kinesia's poetry collection, Voodoo Hypothesis. Subscribe to Hyacinth Podcast on your favorite app and never miss an episode. Go to the website to sign up for the email list and follow at Hyacinth Podcast on social media. I'm Carmel Michael. Thank you for listening and talk real soon. Was I ever that young to come back now like rain? Fingers the color of blossom, plucking hibiscus from their mane. While at dusk, the leisure star falls from altitude sickness. Valley voices sing and somnolent gods weep protest. Where storm clouds complain, but bring no comfort. Was I ever that young to come back now like rain? Even when the mango birds and children vanish, the poet tells us of the common and good in our bones. While at dusk, the leisure star falls from altitude sickness. In the happenstance of discontent and the mind, grandmother story tells in flambeau with fireflies. Was I ever that young to come back now like rain? For years to collect into resumes, orchards, tombstones, and treetops slump beneath their stubborn trail. Was I ever that young to come back now like rain, while at dusk the leisure star falls and altitude remains?